Hello and welcome to Back to Basics, Babies, Bodies and Behaviour with me, Mel, and I'm here with Chiara. Hi. Um, <laughs> pronounce your last name because I will <laughs> Venturoli. <laughs> it's very Italian <laughs> and not very common. Yeah. But Chiara's fine. <laughs> so I'm currently here in Italy with Chiara. Um, and we are bringing you a very special uh, podcast um, with a very special friend and sister of mine, Vinati Sheth, who Hello. is in India. Yes. Keseho, namaste. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, um, we are going to have a conversation today about um, traditional baby wearing throughout Asia, as Benati is like just this powerhouse of information. Um, so, <laughs> so, would you like to introduce yourself to our listeners? Yes. Hello, listeners. Uh, I'm Binati Shade, and uh, I am a writer essentially. And to write uh, pieces, specifically pieces about geopolitical topics, I tend to, you know, acquire all these weird uh, historical and social facts about each country that I work with. So mostly the articles that I've done have centered around the Middle East and Asia. So. Uh, while doing these researches, I did uh, stumble across certain common themes. And one of those common themes was how really, really ancient cultures, as in cultures that are older than 4,000 years, they have had a baby wearing, uh, you could say, history associated to them. Like one baby in the back, one baby in the front, mother doing her thing, while also being pregnant with her third baby, stuff like that. So, yeah, it, uh, it, it's, uh, it's something that I saw for the first time in, uh, I think, I think uh, Human Universe was the BBC documentary where uh, I saw this for the first time that uh, Indian uh, baby carrying was very similar to Japanese baby carrying. And uh, again, I had had a similar experience with... Uh, finding out about Indra and Ashra, which are mythological characters in Japan. But I thought Japanese people copied Indian mythology and I was like very wrong in that belief. So uh, I looked it up and yeah, I found out how putting your babies close to your bodies is, is a very cultural thing, at least across Asia and across the Middle East. Mm. Mm. Yeah. And when you guys gave me the opportunity to blab about it, I was like, yes. <laughs> so what if I was not able to write an article about this? I shall speak about this. And we are so glad that you agreed to. Um, um, yes, yes. So just, just before we go into it, a little bit more about you and your work. Like, you know, tell the audience okay. what, what you do for a living. And yeah. Uh, I, I do a lot of things for a living uh, <laughs> because... I still have no idea what I want, you know, to do concretely with my life. Like this is, this is what I do. So I'm in that experimentation phase. I know I want to write, but what exactly that's, that hasn't been pinpointed yet. So I ghost write books uh, in the nonfiction genre. I translate doujinshis, which is legal fan work coming out of Japan into English and whatever other language uh, my uh, client wants to commission. Uh, then uh, I also do transcripts for uh, my clients, which are uh, these NGO organizations or aid organizations. And uh, I also happen to be a content writer for uh, some tech companies, so technical writing essentially. And for me personally, what I do is, uh, like writing that I do for myself. Uh, what I do is I look through history or geography or a combination of both. And I find stories that, you know, that haven't been told before. So like I did a piece on the history of Kashmir, where uh, the whole thing from the very beginning, like when Shaivism was a thing in the valley, which is 4th century BCE started there and came to when you know uh, the current indian administration 
took off a very significant article of protection which was given to jammu and kashmir so essentially that's uh, the, the reason why i did it is you know context is important we think that people behave in these rash ways because whatever but history is very difficult to overcome you know no matter mm. how much you try to you can't overcome it it's there it's it's lurking in the dna so uh, i did that then i looked up the entire history of principia newton newton's principia mathematica and i found out that the damn apple never fell on newton's head it's just a story people made up <laughs> now it is used you know used as a thing that an apple fell on newton's head and he invented gravity this is something that indians hear you sit and waste away all day you do nothing look at you so i i come i i try to find articles of this sort you know uh, yeah. nobody wants to pay for these kind of things but i think money isn't always important you know sometimes stories need to come out so for yeah. me personally this is the work i do so currently i'm working on an article about medusa uh, yeah and uh, there are three versions right she's a monster she is a protector and uh, she was uh, she was a victim right and uh, what i'm finding from history is she was not just one of those things mm -hmm. it was all of it mm -hmm. and that needs to be mentioned you can't just romanticize a story and you know uh, so yeah i love to do these sort of pieces yeah mm -hmm. and this this is why i love her so much like mimes fascinate me so Yeah, oh, mind like you was like same page. Give me, give me. <laughs> Kiara, we have had the most fascinating conversation about aliens. You have to tell her about our aliens conversation. <laughs> we're talking as if you, we're talking about our neighbors, like yeah. aliens. No, just, yeah, like we we have quite similar minds in some ways, and basically the 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 whole thing with this conversation was no. I'm going to outdo you on these theories and just we just descend into madness. Yeah. There there's a book in this. Yeah. Oh, oh yes. Oh, so for for the listeners who don't know, um um Binati is a co-author of a um, crazy idea that I had about a book um about periods that we wrote in 5 days and published within 7 days. Um yeah, I'll leave some details of that. Mm, uh, that I'm reading, it's amazing. Really, everybody <laughs> should read that. Every single woman and every single man. man. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah. Um, so yeah, should we get into the actual points? Yes. <laughs> yes. We did yes. have to like go off on tangents, so bear with yes. us. <laughs> so yeah. Um, yeah. Let's just let you lead the conversation. And I would like oh, also to um, to point out the uh, how this conversation came uh, oh, yes, and yeah. why we um, uh, we arrived to this conversation. Of course, um, Mel and I we are very um, focused on baby wearing and carrying in arms, uh, which is if we um, have a look at it, it's the carrying in arms and then you have the baby wearing. You know, it's it's a very small part of the whole thing. and being um you know the 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 vast um topic of um rearing children and caring children uh it's very uh defined how everybody in the world carries babies in arms mm. uh because it's something that all humans have in common you know to arms and the body and a newborn to cleanse to uh, but then when you go to the baby wearing side of things that's that's the human and not and not the biological norm uh and the baby wear inside of things is that <clears throat> each society has got its own uh way of um carrying babies with mm -hmm. um with stuff with things with carriers inventions inventions yeah. so they are mm. human tools mm. um and we found out that there's this um of strong uh, western approach to baby wearing in mm -hmm. these last mm -hmm. let's say 10 15 years being something 
really cool, really Western, you know, the Western way of caring children. Whereas the vast majority of the world has got other views, other yes. ideas, other tools. Mm. And there's a very thin <clears throat> line between what, what we as Westerns, you know, white Western culture, think we invented and, mm. and what actually is already there. And it's not for us, you know, like to be in a shop and just, you know, cherry picking just what we like mm. because it fits our needs. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, it's for us to feel peer in a world of, you know, baby wearing and merge with different ideas. Mm. But if yeah. we, if we don't know, uh, we can't say, uh, listen, there's not, there's no such a Western way of carrying. It's the Western cherry picking from yeah. all over the world. Yeah, basically, I think. Um, so th this comes back to um, conversations that we've been having while I've been here with you um, about how dangerous, and you know, I thought, hang on, that's a strong word, but no, it, it is actually the correct term to describe it, um, how dangerous this concept of Western baby wearing is um, in terms of how uh, we as Westerners have like, oh, the word's going, the way we, we sort of um, present it to the, rest, to the rest of the world. And not only that, but the whole white supremacy side of things, um, how our approach impacts on other cultures, um, then, you, you, you know, some cultures feeling like, oh, we need to adopt that way of doing things and how that is damaging traditional practices mm -hmm. when really we are the ones who should be stepping back and going, okay, we've seen what you're doing and we've tried to come up with our own thing <laughs> very, very, <laughs> very heavily focused on um, baby wearing on the front which is quite an, an anomaly isn't it um, and that's a whole other discussion to have not today um, when really what we should be doing is stepping back and listening to other cultures and elevating these voices and getting these stories out out there and known and actually kind of putting ourselves back into our place of no, we are the newbies here, <laughs> you know, and our approaches should not be um, seen as like the way. And, you know, this is, you know, why we're having this conversation today um, as kind of a starting point to hopefully open up some more conversations around this. Yeah, and I, I really like the approach that you guys are trying to talk. You don't, you're not trying to preach, you're just trying to talk. Tell me your, uh, you know, your cultures, your traditions, your ways, and we'll listen. Uh, we are not even going to try to tell you what we do. We're just there to listen. I, I really appreciate uh, that uh, initiative on your part. And I hope that you get, you know, more people from the, from the rest of the world, including the Western world, to like come and share their stories. Because I think our Western culture also is very ancient in nature and yet there is this predominant predominant narrative about uh, you know what modern western culture has be become so to speak so yeah it would be fun to hear some historical uh, western uh, traditions as well yeah. uh, and you know not just get steamrolled by advertising and stuff like that yeah because yeah we do have our traditions in Europe as well but it's of course it's very much no we're not going to make the effort to you know research that and rediscover our own roots it's like oh it's, yeah colonialism is strong <laughs> but yeah. yeah so um i don't know how how you want to start this let me make a joke then if you <laughs> want to know how comfortable Asians are about baby wearing just look up live feed from any Asian railway station 
during uh, office hours, which is uh, till eight in the eight or nine in the morning, and after five pm in the evening. And what you will see is you'll see a lot of men, women, little kids, everyone wearing their backpacks in the front, and. they do this because wearing stuff in the front whether it's a baby or whether it's like a carry bag is something we all just casually do because a we don't want pick pocketers to steal our shit mm-hmm. and <laughs> b we have seen like if you can carry a baby in you, you know uh, close to your body in the front why can't you carry your backpack so <laughs> carrying babies in arms carrying stuff in arms yeah asians are very chill about that and uh, we don't have any sort of shaming when it comes to you know carrying babies in the side front back sometimes you'll see babies sitting on heads <laughs> <laughs> it's adorable <laughs> but yeah that's that that i suppose is the yeah. benefit of having really really gigantic populations so uh yeah mm-hmm. people are so used to dealing with and looking at babies being dealt in different ways and uh, stuff like that so they just stop commenting they like how many times a day are we going to be karens no <laughs> we got to leave people be <laughs> that's cool <laughs> that's very cool yeah yeah so would you like to give us some introduction on uh carrying children in india as a start and then we oh, can yes to other parts yeah yeah we'll pick pick something up yeah yeah sure so uh many again ca- is very big country yeah, yeah. that that was the first Not point fun. i was going to make yeah. uh, india is so different i am from the western side of india i'm from gujarat in india uh and depending on what zone of india you go to baby wearing happens in different direction so northeast india which is india closer to nepal bhutan uh, china that 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 india uh, wears their babies on their back so they have these very cute bamboo things uh, they look like a tea tea picker basket and the baby casually sits in there and that whole thing is strapped onto the mom's back so north india is uh, thankfully because of asian cooperation there's a look east policy that is happening in northeast india has been developed but compared to the rest of india they pr- still pretty under developed so jobs and stuff like that very few in that region other than tourism or tea or uh, tea estates or stuff like that so the mother is really going to be doing these jobs like picking tea leaves or working at a jam factory or working at a fruit picking factory while her kid just chills on her back the entire day and neither the kid has a problem with that because it's happily cooing in the basket nor the mother who's happily working because they do tend to sing songs you know i think i think it was uh, wordsworth who wrote the poem uh, solitary reaper Mm-hmm. we literally have solitary reapers in the northeastern india they are singing away they are chatting away the babies are chilling in the back because again it, it is a developing society so they all have a lot of kids and uh, it it it's just it's such a common place uh, you know a scene that we do, we don't even feel like uh, this could be something we can try because almost everyone in india is carrying their babies somewhere so in in uh, gujarat they tend to carry babies like this uh, under the under the boob so baby is hungry it's going to gr- do the grab and mom will turn towards the wall feed it and go back to doing her thing so uh, that's that's how it's done in gujarat then uh, i think uh, more modern mothers are going for the slings right where uh, uh, this is this is how the baby remains but essentially uh, uh, no where you go will determine how you get to see babies so like coming to jammu and kashmir uh, i forgot the name of the outfit that they have but most people and again this is a theme we'll see in asia we wear our traditional clothing in public uh, like uh, you can stare if you want but yeah most of us will be dressed in our traditional clothes 
so uh, in kashmir you have these very loose uh, sort of uh, i forgot the name uh, but yeah these loose gowns and under that loose gown they generally have a thing where uh, the bodies are being worn because it's very cold up there and because kashmir is a place where a lot of things are grown farming essentially a lot of farming is done uh, people are working throughout the year in the farms so their babies chill under the coat so to speak so they have skin to skin uh, with their parents while their parents are you know doing their uh, uh, or living their good life so essentially kids are a part like little babies are a part of almost every asian uh, household at least in their 6 months old so uh, and during these 6 months uh, you'll have uh, mostly moms doing the carry uh, while they're cooking while they're cleaning while they're working while they're chatting with their friends while they're hanging out of balconies you know it's it's as as i as i was mentioning earlier i have seen so many of my cousins their uh, mothers cooking uh, and uh, the baby is chilling like a kangaroo looking into what their mother is cooking trying to you know uh, yeah I mean, at <laughs> whatever was in the bowl but of mm-hmm. course they're so tiny they can't get at it and um, i distinctly remember when my mother used to cook food uh, I I don't remember being in a carrier, but I remember sitting next to her in the kitchen. There are actually photographs that they have taken, and uh, I am in the corner, small pudgy old me, playing with the dough, playing with the oil, playing with the grains. And each time there's a mess, and because of the mess, there's a photo. So, <laughs> <laughs> so 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 essentially that. there's that that if it's tiny and if it's cute and if it's defenseless they are not going to let it out of their sights uh some experts are calling it uh, i think as i mentioned yesterday night bulldozer parenting like you know they are uh, too invested into their children's lives but i'm like yeah that's what we are supposed to do it's yeah. a cute little baby is supposed to be with it and play with it that's why you had it in the first place uh, <laughs> what yeah Yeah, amazing. So, um, that's it's all fascinating, really, really interesting. Um, and you know what you're saying about you know, the babies being attached to the body and being interested in everything that um that actually ties into the review article that um Bernadette um was lead author of the um we had published recently. Yes. um but one of the things that we explored and discussed within that was um how you know the the baby is is meant to be attached to the caregiver's body um and how it gives the baby a unique perspective on the world um <clears throat> as opposed to being on the floor or whatever they're at the adult height they're meant to be there to learn the language from the caregiver and to interact with the environment and learn basically so yeah yeah hearing the stories like that it's it's really interesting um can i ask you whether like you've observed how um at least you know where where you live um what the in arms carrying practices are like the the way in which in which um babies and children are held in arms without the sling oh oh yeah they they're going to cup the head with uh, their non dominant hand mm-hmm. and they're going to hold the baby with their dominant hand that's how they carry the children like this so oh, this yeah great. this isn't this isn't as i said this isn't the predominant way in which they carry the baby this is in gujarat they do yeah yeah Yeah. So, so I don't know the technical term well, for when, it but when they're older. So when when they're bigger and stronger and can hold their body themselves. Uh, oh yeah, when yeah, when they learn to sit upright that's when it comes here. Ah. So when when their head stops lolling, yeah, yeah, in the crook of the neck uh and yeah, yeah, something like this, like you know like a like a backpack that we wear like a fancy backpack on a sling. 
Yeah, that kind of an angle, like not completely vertical, but at a slant. Okay. Um, yeah. And what about as they get older? Um, do the, is hip carrying a thing? Mm, I, I think so, but not a lot. Like most of them carry them entirely. Like uh, the, the, again, this comes to a class issue as well. Mm. So if you look at the the ladies, the masons that work in the street, uh, the working class, so to speak, as in they're doing masonry, they are working at the woodsheds and stuff like that. Those women, yeah, they tend to carry their babies on the side. But uh, like uh, women from uh, middle class to upper middle class to uh, higher class and stuff like that, they generally, you know, tend to carry the baby entirely. It's not uh, put on the hips and stuff like that. I think it's because of uh, of the aesthetics of it. Like they don't like to show the weight that they put on and you put a baby there, you look chubbier. I've had some of my aunts make that comment. Oh. So I, 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 I'm generalizing it. I don't know what the actual thing is, but a lot of my aunts didn't carry their babies on the hip because they didn't want their loose dresses to kind of bunch at the hip to show that they have gained weight. Oh, interesting. Really? <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I don't know. the Because again, you can't go and ask people these questions, right? Especially when you don't have a kid of your own because it's creepy. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I did, uh, I did ask some of my relatives this because they know I ask creepy questions. I ask a lot of questions. So they were used to it by now that, oh yeah, this one's going to ask a lot of questions. Let it shoot. Best way to deal with it is to answer and make her stop. Yeah. <laughs> we could have a prepared questionnaire like to make it formal so yeah. that you don't go around asking but you like I have a sheet of paper and you know somewhere to hold to you and a pen so you can ask proper questions <laughs> and make you look formal <laughs> and professional <laughs> and you can just say it's for the science it's not for me I'm not creepy <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I am way past that. I have I have no, how, how do you say, I have no ducks to give anymore, <laughs> essentially. <laughs> I'm like, yes, I have a question. If I don't ask it, I'll have to go on Google. And I go on Google, it's going to give me weird, trippy answers. And I don't want that. I want actual human stories because there has to be a difference between like, you know, tech and human experience. And like tech is anyway moving so much faster than culture. So I wanted there to be some questions that I only ask people. But yeah, that would have been so much peace if I could just be like, okay, this is for professional purposes. Help me. <laughs> um, but yeah. Right. Right. Amazing. And can you tell us a bit about other Asian cultures or cultures in Asia that you came into contact with? Oh, yes, yes, definitely. So uh, if there's a very popular TED talk uh, by... Oh, sorry, sorry. I have to pause this here because you told me a really funny story about you baby wearing as a child that you, you need to share. Before okay, you... okay. So, uh, what my cousin did to me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So my baby cousin, I'll not take his name, but uh, okay. Uh, he is my father's youngest brother's only son. And uh, because uh, he was so cute and he used to make these pigeon sounds, I legit call him goo because that's what pigeons sound like. And he only used to make this sound mm, mm, all the time. So that's what I have called him. He, the poor thing is 16 right now. I still call him that. But... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so uh, I got early puberty, right? And because of that, the breasts came in early and the ass came in early. So essentially the body did, you know, start having uh, female characteristics. And I think babies don't understand that mommy boob and other lady boob are different things. So I had gone to, um, I, I, uh, this is when school and life wasn't hectic. So we used to go every weekend 
to my father's paternal house to you know visit the family most of the family on the father's side lives there so we want to meet him and i'm playing and chilling with him and he's being a pigeon and i don't know what happened how how do i am talking to somebody i don't even remember who and i feel this unbelievable pain because this dumb ass has latched on my non lactating breasts and started sucking i'm like there's clothes aren't you supposed to at least wait till the clothes come off no he didn't he was like i needs milk i gets milk <laughs> <laughs> and i'm screaming get take it off so and anyway you have no clue what's going on with your body right as a teenager and then this happens and you're like oh my god what the hell so yeah <laughs> i didn't pick him up for two weeks after that like legit does like he's going to do it again <laughs> i just play with you while you're on the bed i have trauma <laughs> so yeah yeah sorry yeah you can go <laughs> okay so uh, there's a very popular ted talk by the then prime minister of bhutan uh, about bhutan being carbon negative and uh, i think theshrin chobha i I'm, i'm probably getting the name wrong because the pronunciation is uh, yeah so uh, he was again as i said the bbc documentary was the first uh, the human universe thing was the first time i realized oh we are all chimps doing chimpy things all across the world right and uh, then this ted talk was the second time this realization happened where uh, he's talking about bhutan being carbon neutral uh, carbon negative and uh, how bhutan has a uh gdp na what global happiness factor that's what they have for the citizens and mm-hmm. then he talked about how they are so proud of wearing their culture and he had actually given the ted talk in the traditional bhutanese garb and then he showed all the flaps that are built into the outfit and one of those mm-hmm. flaps was a baby wearing flap and he actually shows a picture of him working with his baby chilling in the flap Oh. and i was like oh that's so cute and then i because it was so cute i was like oh i have to see more pictures of babies you know just looking at their uh, dads and moms doing their uh, daily life things and i googled it and i was not disappointed bhutanese people are doing so much by wearing that traditional garb that they have it's, it's got really nice vibrant colors and uh, if they don't put babies in that pouch they're going to put pencils pens potted plants i mean i saw all sorts of thing online so uh, i think that's that that started a rabbit hole and i started looking up what other uh, uh, asian countries you know have this built in their uh, traditional outfits so in uh, in certain uh, tribal communities of india i found uh, that on the uh, during the puja or during the ritual offerings that are uh, uh, invoked to and bless the new mother and her you know soon to be born baby uh, they give these clothes and they give these uh, gifts to the new couple and uh, one of these gifts is this they give a cloth cloth which is supposed to essentially be used to carry the baby like you know uh, as part of the Uh, cute outfit so this is this is a uh, not like a waist cloth this is like a fancy looking clothes that you know they can pair with their outfits at ease like we are seeing people you know pairing masks with their outfits these days <laughs> <laughs> that that sort of a deal so uh, essentially a lot of tribal cultures had this that uh, when they you know come to uh, uh, t- tribal indian cultures when they come to uh, bless the new soon to be new parents they are going to give these gifts and uh, of course once the babies are born they come with food and jewelry so there's that as well but that is something i found then uh, i found uh, because uh, i i was trying to learn japanese at that point and i was uh, 
looking for people I can have conversations with in Japanese to improve the spoken Japanese level, so to speak, because that accent accent is difficult to gain, especially if you take into account my Gujarati accent. Mm. So uh, when when researching uh, that, I I found out about uh, Japanese baby wearing as well, uh, where uh, you know. Uh, to the traditional yukatas and stuff like that, new parents uh, have a, a very smooth uh, and soft material uh, that that they tie, and their baby just you know rests uh, while they shop, while they work, again while they do their daily life things, uh, especially in rural Japan. Uh, where uh, you know people grow uh, and barter their way to a happy, healthy, successful life. So that was something fascinating. Then looking at the Philippines and again the bamboo baskets that they have to carry their infants. So it was it was just fascinating stuff to see that in some direction, whether it was vertical, uh, a diagonal, or horizontal. Mm. People across Asia had come up with, uh, you could say, uh, weird kind of knots and uh, material, uh, you could say, combinations to ensure that their baby can have the best uh, life mm. while not interrupting their parents' life. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, like, uh, this, this, this might be, you know, a bit culturally insensitive to say, but... You will not see that many Asian mothers or fathers, you know, complaining about their babies not letting them sleep or not letting them, uh, you know, live their life or whatever, because they integrate and assimilate their babies into their daily life. Like that is how the cultural practices, you know, they uh, we don't have an option to say no to cultural practice, like uh, because uh, we don't have that individualism built into our uh, society, so, social structure. We are more society focused in a way. So if we want to say no to certain, yeah, if you want to say no to certain social structures, there are so many people that are going to come and bully, literally bully you into uh, following the cultural way that somehow, you know, you manage to assimilate the baby into your daily life and it's like uh, we don't have aphorisms of the sort when the baby sleeps you sleep or uh, when the baby poops you poop no nothing like that baby does its thing you do your thing that's what is the predominant narrative here yeah amazing it's just so amazing really yeah. yeah, it is. It is, and and the, see, other thing is this. This would probably be derogatory to Asians, but there are people have so many kids. Not all of them anymore, but then in some 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 parts uh, of our country, especially the lower middle class and uh, uh, you know the below poverty line uh, people, they just keep having kids, kids after kids after kids after kids. So if you don't get used to it. Uh, you're going to lose your mind. So <laughs> you have to come up with, you know, ways to be okay with uh, having babies and dealing with babies. Otherwise, survival becomes a problem, which is anyway a problem with them given their socioeconomic status. Yeah. Um, I have a question to put to you. Um, yeah. Um, to do, I mean, we, we've had conversations before now and before we started recording this. Um, before we started recording this, um, we were talking about um, the Western impact on traditional cultures and, um, you know, the, the, the harm that comes from, um, sure. you know, thinking that, oh, we know best kind of thing. And then um, what, what happens if other cultures uh, take on that narrative? Um, and then that harms their traditional practices by sort of elevating the, the white Western viewpoint. Um, so I don't, I don't know if you do have any views on this, but the question that I wanted to put to you is how, how do you think that um, traditional cultures can 
protect their traditions from, you know, this invasion of um, white Western baby wearing practices and also how do you think we, um, especially kind of us who have these um, baby wearing trainings of, you know, the Western methods and stuff, um, how can we help protect um, traditional practices and minimize um, your your audio is stuck your audio is stuck uh, what i heard is uh, do i have any opinions about it? yeah your audio is still stuck yeah what stuck 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 stuck, stuck. Oh, I saw a head bob. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. It's stuck again. Are you guys there? Hello. I can't hear anything. I checked my internet. It's good to go. Internet. It's good to go. Ooh, now I can see you guys. Aha. Ooh, now I can see you guys. Yes, and we are trying to pull yeah. off my laptop. It was in the sun, and I we didn't I didn't see it was that much in the sun. Oh, <laughs> so, it's so it had overheated whole thing. Mm. Okay, so I believe the question that I got was, uh, what is the influence of white Western culture on traditional practices when it comes to baby wearing, and do I have any opinions or, or any suggestions for? people who do in arms training uh, to help them protect traditional practices over uh, you know white uh, practices yeah, yeah because we're we're in a position of responsibility basically in the work that we right. do um, and i think you know we us personally we have made certain steps to ensure that we get across the what we are teaching um, mm -hmm is very different to um, traditional practices and stuff. And, you know, hi highlight um, the position of privilege that um, white Western parents are in. Yes, yes, baby wearing is used as um, an essential tool as well. But um, like, for example, the positioning at the front very much has roots in um, attachment parenting, doesn't it? Um, with the whole, um, the privilege of being able to use baby wearing for bonding and, you know, using it um, not just as like, okay, I need to keep baby attached and happy while I go about my daily work and chores and stuff. Yes, it is used as well, but it's, I, I think it kind of gets used extensively beyond what it may be used for um if if we didn't have this kind of uh privileged life of you know all the appliances and everything that cuts down the time that we need to spend um doing other things so then we use that freed up time to be like oh so we're gonna bond with baby and yeah sorry i've just i've just kind of gone off i totally that. agree i totally agree and I would yeah, baby add, is uh, no no go ahead. I would add just another point and, and I don't know if it's if it's just you know inland Europe or or more generalized in baby wearing, but there are many schools, baby wearing schools that uh, you know teach in a way um, 
you have to follow the rules mm. you have to follow safe safety baby wearing rules there's a way of carrying your baby which is safe and there's yes. a way which is not safe and that 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 really you you very much highlighted one of the biggest issues yeah, that was actually going to be one one of my answers as well because literally kids are allowed to eat in india kids are allowed to eat sand mud whatever they want when they play Our parents don't scold us when we do that. i have literally eaten every damn plant in the vicinity and no one scolded me i could have eaten something poisonous but they don't stop us from exploring the world that we live in uh, like there is no such narrative that this is safe and this is unsafe mm. but nowadays in the in the in the stuff that we see or uh, in these uh, again I, i tend to focus on the intention and these really well intentioned people you know come uh, into our societies and tell us that you know your way of doing things isn't safe try this instead and yeah maybe stop doing that you know that's mm-hmm. this is a country of more than billion people like they know how to keep babies alive <laughs> and well yeah there's a reason there's a billion of them right and it just doesn't involve popping more out it also involves keeping the things you popped out alive yeah. so yeah that's 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 one thing that that you know that we feel and and we do tend we do get offended when someone comes and says this things out loud in a very well intentioned innocent way and because uh, there is as i said there's a more societal narrative rather than individual narrative that runs in asia we won't scream or cuss this person out we'll be like okay this is white person or brown person or black person or asian person <laughs> we stereotype essentially which is not correct either but uh, again it's like making the best out of a bad situation sort of a thing so yeah we we do get told a lot of times by well intentioned uh, organizations that come into our country and don't try to learn about our country right and they just come in with this predefined narrative which is you are supposed to hold babies this way mm. your babies are supposed to come out that way you're supposed to position it this way and in doing so what they unconsciously do is now this is a new mother right and uh, new mother is she has so much information these days you have books you have mommy blogs you have annoying relatives who are giving you tips right you've got so much information coming at you from all directions and then you have these uh, quote experts come in and tell you that this is how you're supposed to do it and you think okay this is an expert this is whom i should listen to and so you start following their way you go home keep following their way and because uh, in india there's a tradition once you have a baby you live with your the girl goes back to her mother's family mother and father's family and lives there uh, till the past per, uh, past partum recovery and all that is done i think they do it to protect the women uh because indian men sometimes are very very it's very difficult to deal with uh in certain regards right uh so yeah the indian mom and uh, the, the new mother and her baby live with her parents and now see the parents mostly have followed the cultural way of life they are going to see their child raise their new child using these you know uh western expertise ways and they are going to scold the mom saying why are you doing it like this do it like this instead so the new mother is going to get more confused and she's going to probably fight with her own mother uh, over because she's like that's the expert this person has phd this person has blah 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 years of experience that's i should listen to them and unconsciously this is preparing like a whole word of new mothers who are following this tradi- this way and ignoring the traditional way right and see th- there is nothing wrong with trying new things and new practices but when when companies training companies from outside organizations from outside come in and just you know put their narrative onto a culture that has been doing things a certain way for a very long time 
it creates like a generational polarization yes and this comes back to the whole um impact versus intent doesn't yeah, matter yeah. what the intentions are it's the impact that you know we've got yeah. to look at and listen to and change our ways basically because you know like you're saying it's it's just and this is why we're we're asking these questions of um you know what um you know what do we do to um minimize impact of you know our teachings and stuff because even if we think that we're teaching in a specific way we are still contributing to the wider impact mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that is, is harmful to traditional. I, I think what you guys can do, this is a suggestion. And I, I, I'm giving this suggestion as someone who doesn't have a kid. Someone who hasn't raised a kid. I just play with kids. And there are lots of kids in the family and neighborhood. So my, my, my suggestion would be, you know, if you guys do one-on-one -on -one sessions with your patients, you can also include uh, their family as in some elderly member from their family and listen to what they have to say. Like, mm -hmm. uh, just ask them, how did you raise your child? And they'll tell you 30, 30 ish minutes of dialogue, which will give you uh, some insight into what the cultural practice of your particular client is. Again, this could only happen if you do one on one sessions. You can't do that with like a group session, right? Because even, even if you look at Gujaratis, as I said, uh, each Gujarati sub caste and sub religion has different traditions and India has 26 other states. So Gujarati, Marathi, Bengali, Uriya, everyone has its own, uh, you know, has their own tradition. And even, even two Gujarati families won't have the same tradition. So there's, there's no like common framework that you guys can come up with to ensure mm -hmm. that you're not subconsciously, you know, uh, influencing people. Uh, so if you could do, if, if it allows, you know, if your training module allows one one-on-one -on -one sessions with somebody elderly from their family, you can get like a baseline. And so mm -hmm. you can avoid certain things because certain practices, I agree, certain practices that are followed in our culture, they need to go, uh, especially related to gender and stuff like that. The, the thing that it, it, it exists and it's sad. And those practices need to be gradually weeded out. Uh, so you, you, you can just talk to the elderly and get a framework of what you can avoid to do instead of looking for what you can do. Because uh, so certain, certain things could trigger in the biases, certain things could trigger in uh, a sort of stigma or shame that is associated to a practice. My turn. Sorry, um, yep. I'm the pasty one, so I've, I've been sat there trying to shield myself from the sun. It's sunny, yeah, <laughs> and hot. I that's why you need sunscreen. this. That's why you need this. <laughs> Lemelanine. <laughs> I give you a lot, your shades of melanin. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. We can stand in sun for hours, and it's like, yeah, we turned dark brown. Came home, right. washed it off. <laughs> we are back right. to life. Yeah, yeah. I'm seeing it. I'm seeing. There's a, there's a part of you that's pink, which was in the sun. Yeah. See. Yeah. That's it. That's it. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. Let's go to the beach this afternoon. Come on. I'm not allowed to get pink. <laughs> the advantage to that is if I get humiliated or embarrassed or something like that, no one would know because I blush. <laughs> it's like ha ha. <laughs> Go figure. Look for the pinkness. You can't find it. You are a woman. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. It's it's really helpful and insightful to hear your thoughts and um, that perspective about um, uh, elder family members um, with families who we work with um, who are from different cultures. That's, yeah, that's something definitely going to be thinking further about. 
Yeah, so uh, to add a bit more context to what I said, like as I said, the mother goes, the new mother goes back to her own mother yeah. to, you know, take care of a baby. And if she doesn't have a mother or she doesn't have much of a maternal side of the family, someone from the extended maternal family will take care uh, of the new baby and the new mom. And in, when I say take care, uh, you guys have definitely heard of doulas, right? You can hire doulas and they come and cook and yes. stuff like that for you. Doula. Oh, yes, 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 exactly. <laughs> so if, if you look at the kind of foods that doulas make, right? Uh, their focus isn't on gourmet cuisine. Their focus isn't on, uh, you know, make the mother uh, uh, full so that she can produce more milk. Their focus is to ensure that your nutritional uh, profile uh, elevates without much of uh, supplements and stuff like that. So, if you look at the if you look at the meal charts of doulas, uh, you will see how they have decided how the whole cultural uh, thing exists. Like for one week, they will only give you this. For the next week, they will give you this. Then they will start giving you this. So, Sorry, can I just ask a question? Are you talking about doulas in India? Like, yeah, I'm talking about doulas in India. Yeah, just uh, and, for our listeners. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So uh, we, we don't call them doulas, but these are like your elderly women in the family who yeah. are helping you cope with your new baby. So mm -hmm. they will feed you this diet, this essential diet of uh, uh, different things each week. And you feel like they're pampering you, but no, actually they are ensuring that, you know, you don't hemorrhage. You get your iron up, your carbohydrate and fat content is on point, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, for how long, for how long uh, are they uh, taking care of you? I think at least a month. Nowadays it's become a month, but back in the day it used to be around six months. Wow. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. In, Indian families are joined, used to be joined families, right? So mm -hmm. uh, you are you live with your parents till they die. Then you inherit their house, and then your kids live in their house with you till you die, and that's how it used to be. But with urbanization, uh, nuclearized nuclearized families have become a thing. So parents mostly live in their ancestral houses now, and children uh, live in the cities or live close by. And try to visit their parents on the weekend. Right. Mm -hmm. That thing about um, about the mother going back to her, her parents when the baby was uh, was born and uh, when the baby is born um, really makes me think about um, the stories my grandmother used to tell me. Um, because actually, um, in in I would say in Europe, but let's just focus on Italy. Um, there was this major shift in very few generations. So if you think about, um, my grandmother was born in the, tw the 1920s and she gave birth in the 1950s. And up to that point, um, uh, especially in rural Italy, when you had a baby, uh, you could stay in your house because it was meant to be a family house, not only your family, but your parents' family mm -hmm. and all your yeah, brothers and yeah. sisters you know, an extended family in this way. And mothers were really pampered and they had the privilege to stay in bed 30 days. And the only thing they had to do was to breastfeed. And mm -hmm. there was always a woman around doing something for her, like giving her a bath, feeding, um, taking care of the washing, of the cooking, of the other parts of the family. Mm -hmm. And... Um, but when I was born, I was born late 70s, uh, that was already way lost. It was already really lost as, um, as a culture. Not, not, well, it was already lost in, in towns, but also in rural Italy, it was not, it was not that anymore. So that is I'm very thinking quick. That, that's within 30 very, years, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, that was very, very quick. And mm. I think we lost a lot. We really... Indeed. And during so this, pandemic, this, has, uh, this has been a major issue, actually, because mothers uh, uh, had to give birth in hospitals on their own without, they don't know, just midwife, maybe a doctor if they needed it, but no one by her side due to the 
the whole lockdown yeah. situation. And then after 48 hours, they were sent home and nobody could visit. So yeah. we just had this, you know, set of four months of children that were born alone and without any help, which is on one side, you can think about it as a fascinating, you know, as the perspective of not having interference mm -hmm. in your parenting and, you know, just, yeah. Yeah. you know, feel free to parent the way you feel. But on the other mm -hmm. hand, mm -hmm. I think that it was most, uh, the loneliness, yeah. Yeah. not knowing what, what to do with, you know, a two days old child and, uh, so yeah, hopefully we are getting, I don't think that we will get back that family system and that level of care on mothers, of family care on mothers. But in some way we will, I hope, get have uh, some, some kind of social um, network. Of, yeah. Uh, I think yeah. It, this, is, this come, has come back full circle for me, um, at least in my head. Um, I'm thinking like th this again goes back to the whole how our practices then influence on other cultures who um, where people maybe think more highly of Western ways or whatever and how the narrative needs to change and maybe you know it's one of the ways to do that is being much more vocal about the negative um, aspects of you know even you know the baby wearing practices and the postpartum and everything really highlighting the negatives and stop elevating our practices as um, the be all and end all I think and, yeah, yeah, yeah. pretty much communication right all of our conversations yeah. ultimately uh, come and get stuck there we need to communicate honestly mm -hmm. oh rather than for yeah. optics so literally I'm, I'm gonna um, <laughs> this is going to sound like a plug for the book, but it's it's not intended to. <laughs> but um, this comes back to um, these five co-authors, all being neurodiverse, all being like, no, we, we communicate directly. And when you communicate directly, um, you can achieve things like writing a book in five days because you cut out all of the crap, all of the tiptoeing around and all saying one thing but meaning another thing just direct no. take your ego out of it take take your feelings out of it and just have the conversations and then change or progress whatever it's like that. done yeah it, it will happen yes yeah. it will mm -hmm. low okay <laughs> we are very 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 low on battery so um i think we're going to have to wrap this up here but yeah we we can talk for hours Yes. Any, yes, we can. So, <laughs> yeah. We truly hope. I'm sure to, that there will be another one. Yeah. Yeah. I truly hope we we got the, you know, um, some some points for the people to think about yeah. when they approach other cultures and um, yeah. think that the world is a very big, massive place, and everybody needs the same respect. Yes. Which is yeah. major. There's nothing yes. like. I know better. Just be yeah, exactly. Nobody knows better. <laughs> Nobody knows better, right? We're all human beings. As, as I just made a joke, we are all chimps doing chimpy things. Yeah. <laughs> pretty much, yeah. Yeah, pretty much. And we all have our own weird uh, rituals. We can respect them and learn from our uh, uh, respective cultures as well. That, that could lead us to some one size fit all kind of a solution way into the future but for that we need to be a bit honest like yes. i cannot say to you your practices are wrong and you cannot say that to me as well yes. yeah so you're still hoping back to respect and mm -hmm. not listening to these stories and having these conversations and then going off and um monetizing it basically yeah which sure. happens a lot in Western cultures. Um, Ring the bell icon. Hey. <laughs> Ring the bell icon to subscribe. <laughs> when you said mo when you said monetize, <laughs> I immediately remembered that because everyone wants us to ring the bell icon, essentially. So they get the cha-ching. 
Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so much thank for you. joining thank us. Thank you, really. Yes. Thank yes. you so much for inviting me. Anytime. Have a fun conversation. Have fun at the beach, guys. We will. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for listening, uh, listeners. And yeah. we'll speak to you again soon. We open for questions. Yes. If anybody wants yes. to ask anything or, you know, ask anything, <laughs> we're here. Yeah. Bye. Bye. <laughs> right. Oh, I know. No. You haven't shut the recording. I know. <laughs>